I really don't have time with that. Right. Let me just, let me just, you, you don't have to come on the picture. If you want to say, my, my friend here is saying, how can you say the Bible is historical accurate because you can't confirm everything? It's a very good point. What I was saying to him is that if you can verify the principal points in the structure of the Bible, you have what is called a plausibility structure in science. Uh, when they say something is a historical, uh, a scientific fact, they say it's a plausibility structure. So they have certain big information that confirms what they're saying. Now they've not got all the information, but they've got some information. Let, let me finish. Let me finish. So that is a plausibility structure. So say they've got seventy percent. They've got seventy percent of the information, but they haven't got thirty. But they say it's a fact because they've got 70 percent now in the bible there's certain big facts that mention and that we can verify and then not only that we have hundreds if not thousands of little facts that are verified so in the book of acts for example i just quoted dr Hermer, who is a secular scholar who says there are 64 uh, facts in the gospel of luke that's only half the gospel he's not said the other half He's writing well, as a second. The definition for him to use the word fact, it's only got to be 70% true, so there's 30%. So until it's 100% true, you're relying on your belief. So, so by you stating that you believe this to be true, it's as accurate as you can be. You believe it to be true, you can't prove it to right, be it's, it's a good point what you're saying, but that's not that's not the case. No, but it, in knowledge, in not? knowledge, nobody in knowledge, in any area of knowledge, has 100%. Nobody. Nobody in the biology department has 100% information on biology. No one has 100% information in any discipline. But we can still have knowledge and say, this is a fact, this is a fact, on the 70%, right? So, you'll find in any history, any history book, even if we look to the Second World War, yeah? Or, or the killing of JFK. There will be some things that we don't know, but we can say A happened, B happened, C happened, right? So what I'm saying, brother, and it's a good point you're making, is whatever historical uh, inquiry that we make, there's always going to be a, a point where we're not going to know everything, okay? But we can know a lot and say that that document is a faithful, accurate document from what we know. You're only stating that faithful, accurate document. So it's an accurate, it's inaccurate because it's, you're relying on faith in order to, 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 to found the other 30% is true. So by you stating the Quran is a book of belief, you cannot not apply the same logic to the Bible because you cannot physically prove it. There's no evidence to suggest that everything you say is actual fact. So therefore the Bible in the same respect is a book of belief. I'm not knocking either way, but what it is is it's a book of belief because you can't physically prove that those things actually definitely happen and you're relying on the opinion of whoever did whoever documented it. You don't have facts to corroborate what these things happen, you just have people cross-referencing it, but then we have to believe that they are 100% accurate, which by your own statements as well, we can't rely on. So therefore the Bible itself would be in a similar vein as the Quran as it's a book of belief. Because you have no evidence or proof to suggest that anything that is in these little books is actually true, you have to install an element of belief yourself. You have to invest in it yourself. Because otherwise, then otherwise you're actually inaccurate. You know? Okay. But one or two things that you're saying that I agree with, there's a couple of things that I disagree with. I think you're stretching it a bit when you, well, a lot, when you're talking about when we look at historical documents, right? Just hear me out. When we're looking at ancient historical documents, we historians give the benefit of doubt to that document. The benefit of the doubt. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Just let me finish. Let me finish. Because I can let you speak a lot, and I respected you. When historians are looking at documents, they give that document the benefit of the doubt. But then, when they start to cross-check it with other sources, if it begins to crumble under those sources, they begin to say that source is not a reliable source, right? But if they start to cross-check it and it begins to correspond to the cross-checking, they then say it's a reliable source, right? Now. So that's different from what you're saying, because what you're saying is it's not reliable at all, it's just belief. Now hear me out, 
But there is an element of belief because it's not a hundred percent. So there has to be an element of faith. And not only that, we're not only trusting in the historical facts, we're trusting in a person called God. And, in, in, and, and so the book that is a historical document is also represented as a divine book. So there is an element of faith, so you're correcting that. But you're stretching it when you start moving to documents because the, when you start looking at ancient documents, we can say that document, generally speaking, is historically reliable. So let's compare the Quran. The Quran says Jesus did not die on a cross. The Bible says Jesus died on a cross. You have four Gospels that said he died on a cross. And those Gospels were written in the first century. The Quran was written 600 years after Jesus. Let me finish. The Gospels were based on eyewitnesses. Okay. Let, let me finish. Let me finish. Secondly, we have information outside the Bible, outside the Gospels, with Josephus and Tacitus, 110 AD, roundabout, both enemies that say that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. The Quran has no evidence to substantiate this claim. So I can say, on a major historical event, the Quran is not a reliable source for history. Wait a minute. And the Bible, i.e. the Gospels, is a reliable source of history. Now over to you. Well, you're stating that because the Quran was, was written centuries after, and yet you're then using the reference of 110 AD, AD standing and Adama after his death. Right? So you're relying on the evidence of 110 years after this, this incident happened. Yeah. So there's no way that person witnessed it. Like even now, a 110 year old person is very rare. And then once they reach 110, their memory isn't anyway near as reliable as it could be. So you are actually relying on second-hand information. So what you're stating is the Gospel was written on second-hand information, so instantly that negates the, the fact okay. that you can go, yes, it is definitely factual uh, by your 70% point, point, point factual. So by that statement, you again, you have to rely on belief because you can't have anything else, because you can't corroborate it. You don't have the evidence to suggest this is definitely true. Same as perhaps so, so the Quran. Are you a Muslim or a Christian? No, I'm neither. I'm not, neither. I'm, 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 I have no religious faith. I'm, I'm when we do his, when you're, when you're doing his, you made some good points. When you're doing historical inquiry, that is, you have to have certain criteria, right? Because otherwise you could just make it up. Let me finish, let me finish, right? You, you've got to have criteria, or otherwise you can just make it up. It can be just your subjective opinion. So people have to agree, scholars have to agree, the general general methods of inquiry in historical, in historical studies. Now one of the uh, historical methods is enemy attestation. When your enemies attest to your statements, that is generally regarded by historians as good historical data, right? So, so, who's so the enemy wait a minute, case? wait a minute, because he came in. So, when you came in and said the stuff that you said, you were saying it from a layman's point of view. I'm now telling you how academic historians verify something that's happened in history. One of the one of the methods is enemy attestation. So, from an academic point of view. In the academic world, that is good historical information if you've got one enemy, but you've got two enemies, and you have more enemies that mention about Jesus dying, actually. But I've just mentioned two, right? Now secondly, there has been a revival and there has been a movement within the academic world. It used to be said that the Gospels were written in the second century, not the first century. It was made up by the communities and it was myth. Because they found documents like P45 in Ryland's library, they now realize the Gospel of John was written in the first century. So that means the other Gospels should have been written in the, other, in the first century. So from instead of believing the Gospels were written in the second century, they now realize it's written in the first century. On top of that, because they believed it was written in the second century by communities, they now realize because it's written in the first century, they asked another question. Who wrote it? It can't be just the communities. And they, they, began, they began to see that actually historians of the time actually wanted to use 
eyewitness material. So you have in the Gospel of Mark, if you read the Gospel of Mark, it's very similar to the sermon when Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 2. So you see that the Gospel of Mark is based on Peter's sermon. Mark, as you know, was a friend of Peter, and so it has the same style as the sermon of Peter. And that's why uh, Richard Balcom called it what is called an inclusio, an indication that it's based on the eyewitness of Peter. So, in conclusion, you've made some brilliant points. Well, I come back at you and say, number one, scholarship is beginning to move to the idea that the Gospels are based on eyewitnesses. And number two, scholars use enemy attestation. If you're going to debunk me, you've got to debunk that criteria. Go for you, bro. And I appreciate what you're saying. For me to, to state that my enemy stated, how do I know that my enemies are, are, are telling the truth? You know, you're relying on the on the, on the source of, a, of an opposition, so to speak. That's right. And, and, and then again, if you're relying on sources, you're saying like 110 AD, so that's technically speaking to this second so 110 years. How do we know that that information has been distorted in those 110 years? I mean, if the average it's lifespan is 50 odd years, so that, 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 my, my main problem with the whole thing is that the, the, the lack of being able to corroborate. And if you can't corroborate it effectively to state that yes, this is definitely true, one, you have to use belief, and two, you can't use that your book is a book of belief argument on another book which other people believe to be true, when you can't actually physically prove the, set, the, the opposite to be true for yours, you know? You made a point, you've said about the enemies, <coughs> the enemies could just be making it up, yeah. it's a good point. But then you have other criteria, scholars have other criteria. The other criteria that they have is, wait a minute, not only enemy attestation, but multiple attestation. So, let's say you shot somebody, right? And we want to find out wait a two of your enemies say that you did it, right? So they could have been lying. But if we corroborate it with about six other sources, it kind of makes you look bad. Even makes people. Me look bad. Yeah, That's yeah. But wait, 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 wait. So there's another way, there's other ways of verifying historical data, and that is multiple attestation. So you have other sources, like Suetonius and other sources, that also indicate that Christ died. Okay, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. So, in this discussion, the friend here was trying to uh, critique what I was saying about historical information in the Bible, that the Bible's accurate in what it says. And I hope from what you've learned from this is that the Bible, when it makes big statements like about Jesus dying, <laughs> we can verify it in history. Another example, scholars said that, that Moses didn't write, in the 19th century, scholars said Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. And it was based on Bauhausen hypotheses. Bauhausen lived a few more, a uh, hundred years more than uh, the 19th century. And Bauhausen had this hypothesis of J.P. They were editors of the Pentateuch. And that was the idea. And that went into the 19th century and 20th century. And there was this idea that Moses couldn't have written it because of <coughs> these editorial ideas of the Pentateuch. But number one, Bauhausen was a Hegelian. He believed in Hegelian philosophy. And the idea of thesis, antithesis, synthesis was behind his academic study of history. So his statement about Moses could not have written uh, the, uh, the, the Pentateuch was not based on data, it was based on a philosophical concept. That's number one. Number two, we began to find in Assyria and the ancient world at the time of Moses uh, documents showing that writing was, was well uh, formed in the ancient world, in Syria and Babylon and all these places. Verifying, my friend, verifying that writing can, can be done at the time of Moses. And that was one of the principal reasons why scholars said in the 19th century that Moses didn't write it because there was no writing. But yet we found tons and tons and tons of information in the Hittite Empire, in the Assyrian Empire, and in Babylon. We found all these documents to show that actually there was uh, all these documents. Uh, we found all these documents to verify 
that there was writing in the time of Moses. So what I'm saying is, my friends, uh, we another one is that Moses couldn't have written it because it had a too well too well developed concept of God. Monotheism, monotheism wasn't around in the time of Moses. We found ancient documents that show that even there were other ancient uh, uh, cultures that believed in one God. So scholars were debunked in the 19th century. Today, the Wahlhausen hypothesis is in uh, it's been in disarray for over 15 years. Scholars still use it but they don't know what to put in its place but it shows you the bankruptcy of modern scholarship and, and the purity and the wonder of the greatness of God's word. God bless you.